Hi everyone, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be back. As, as you just heard, I, I gave the very first one of these, um, which uh, a lot of my friends were, were very kind of being here in the audience, some of whom weren't, Mishy, but uh, we don't name names here. Um, so tonight I'm going to be giving you guys somewhat of a, 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 a talk about how astronomers actually go about the process of observing the evolution of galaxies. And what we're going to do is we're basically going to start by talking about uh, a simple question. We're going to pose a question and then we're going to go through and we're going to try and answer that question. And as we throw up a few complications, I'm going to show you how we sort of, you know, get around those complications. So the talk that we're going to be, the question that we're going to be trying to answer tonight is, is, is this one. Is, this is the Milky Way, as, as you're probably already well aware. Uh, the Milky Way looks like this. It looks like a spiral galaxy. And the question that I want to pose to everyone tonight, and the question we're going to try and answer is why? Why does the Milky Way look the way that it does, as opposed to look some other way? For example, like this sort of oval-shaped mass of stars that you see on the right. How can we take this picture of the Milky Way? So, that's a, actually, it's a perfect answer, for, lead into my next slide. So, Naturally, we cannot take a picture of the Milky Way from above because we are embedded within the Milky Way. So this is actually a simulation of what the Milky Way looks like based on the data that we've taken from the ground. But we can do a little bit better than this simple simulation. So let's actually start by doing that because this is a bit blurry and a bit, and a bit you know, too sciencey and I want something that looks pretty. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this picture of the Milky Way and we're going to say, actually, I know the Milky Way looks like a spiral galaxy, and so I can look at other spiral galaxies in the neighborhood, and I can say, I think that the Milky Way should look something like this. And so we can then just basically go into our favorite Photoshop editor, we can twist things around, we can bend things around, and we can get this. This is sort of what we think the Milky Way probably looks like if we were able to fly you know, millions of light years up and then take a picture of it from above, which obviously we can't do. So this is, our, this is our picture of the Milky Way that we're going to be basing our, our discussion off tonight. So the first thing that we might ask when we're, when we're saying, why does the Milky Way look the way that it does, is a simple question. Is, well, do all galaxies look like this? Because if all galaxies look like this, then we can pack up our tools and we can go home. Because the Milky Way is a galaxy, they all look like this, so the answer is solved. But what we find when we look around the local neighborhood of the universe is that galaxies are quite diverse. Galaxies don't all look like this. We have galaxies like this one, which is also a spiral galaxy, but doesn't have that strong bar component in the middle of it. It's got these sort of wavy spiral arms that sort of jut out at all random angles. But they're not only spiral galaxies that we see in the nearby universe. We also see these weird ring sort of galaxies with, with long, uh, you know, yellowish centers and rings of blue stars around the outside and weird little things going on in the middle. And so this is another question. I mean, what, what, why do galaxies look like this? Or do they even look like that first picture that we saw, these little sort of yellowy blobs of, you know, elliptical sort of oval-shaped stars? Or do we see other galaxies in the universe that, quite frankly, don't look like they have any structure at all? And we do. We see these just masses of stars that don't appear to have any obvious structure. So again, we're struck by this question. Why is it that the Milky Way looks the way that it does? And it's important to realize that not only do we have this diverse array of galaxies, this diverse sort of spectrum of different types of shapes, all of these things are constantly interacting with one another. They don't just sit on their own and exist in their own little bubbles. They're all sort of bumping into one another and swirling around one another, as you can see these two just here. Some of them are interacting so violently that the galaxies cease to look like galaxies at all and you end up with these sort of onion ring structures of where galaxies have been smashing into one another and shredding themselves apart. And so again, we have these external factors, these interactions of galaxies that change the way in which galaxies look. Bingo. And so... Yeah, so these are all stars. So these are different stars of different, uh, basically, uh, densities. It's, the, it's basically just a projection effect of these particular things. So we have this diverse spectrum 
of what galaxies look like. We as astronomers group them into a few different categories usually. You may have seen this before. This is what we routinely refer to as sort of the Hubble tuning fork of galaxy types. You have these sort of blobby, round looking things on the left and then you have this sort of spectrum that goes all the way through to your disk galaxies here which we call spirals and then all the way on the very edge you have these irregular galaxies that don't appear to have any structure whatsoever. So the question that we ask is, is this because just of the way in which galaxies interact with one another? Do all galaxies start looking one way, interact with one another and end up spreading out into this uh, spectrum of things? But if that were the case, we'd be ignoring one other very important thing, which is that galaxies themselves are very complex things internally, as we just heard from Frank's talk. So galaxies comprise of lots of different components. They have these, these very hot, luminous blue stars, like you can see here in the, in the Pleiades. These are the, the seven sisters that you can see if you look up in the night sky at the moment. These hot stars are complemented by very old stars, very cool stars that are not blue hot anymore. Now they're sort of yellow hot and white hot and red hot. And these cold stars are then augmented by these huge luminous pools of gas. And I point out that this is the same Orion Nebula that Frank showed, but objectively a much nicer picture <laughs> of the Orion Nebula. How hot is hot? Frank? <laughs> uh, Frank's picture is nicer and he's gonna answer that question for you. How hot are these gases around the Orion Nebula? Um, Frank doesn't know either, so it's a draw. <clears throat> My picture is now the best again. So the, the ionized gas is about 10,000 degrees or more. That's a typical temperature for the ionized gas. Right? Show off. <laughs> and, then, and then just to end things, we have these vast clouds of cold dust that Frank spoke about quite extensively. And these clouds of dust don't just sit on their own, as again we heard from Frank, they tend to collapse together and then they assist in the cooling of gas which then goes on to form the nurseries where new stars are eventually born, these you know, huge molecular clouds that we find. So the question doesn't just become, do galaxies interact with one another and become the way that they look? or is it just something internal? It's, it's a combination. Are the differences that we see in galaxies due to internal effects, external effects, both? Maybe neither. Maybe it's something that we haven't even begun to consider yet. And so the question that we really want to ask when we say why does the Milky Way look the way that it does is why do any galaxy, does any galaxy look the way that it does? We want to explore how galaxies grow and evolve over the age of the universe. We want to determine what's driving these differences that we see. If we were not astronomers, so if we were, say, botanists, for example, and I want to take a pause here to apologise to all of the botanists who are watching, because I'm about to absolutely butcher your profession. If we were a botanist, we would plant the seeds of our object of study. We would then watch the growth and evolution of our objects of study in real time. And we would say, what are the causes of the differences that we see in the final state of our objects of study? Is it because some of them have different internal differences, different root lengths, or is it external differences? Is it to do with the depth that we originally plant our seed? Is it to do with the distance between neighbouring plants? All of these things seem to influence the very end of our object of interest, the end state of our object of interest. Now as astronomers, we want to do the same thing but with galaxies. So what we do is we take a universe, we take the universe that starts at the Big Bang and goes through till today, we have another bingo team over there <laughs> that goes through the Big Bang all the way to now. And now we're looking at the growth of galaxies on very, very long time scales. Everything that we're talking about here takes a very, very long time to occur. So 
very near to the Big Bang, the first stars begin to form. A long time after that, the first galaxies begin to form. The Milky Way forms shortly after that. And we're talking cosmological timescale. So naturally in the middle here is where we put the beginning of the construction of the new Berlin airport. <laughs> Absolute cosmological timescales. And so this, this is the box that we're interested in. This is where galaxy evolution occurs. So what we're going to do, we're going to be our botanists, we're going to take our seeds of galaxies, we're going to plant them at the Big Bang or very near to when the first galaxies form, and we're then going to evolve them forward. And we're going to watch to see, well look, some of them turn out as flocculent and unformed weird galaxies with no obvious structure. Some of them form these rich shell structures and some of them form beautiful spirals like the Milky Way. And then we're going to say, we've done it. We've figured out galaxy evolution. But naturally, we can't do that because we can't plant galaxies at the beginning of time. We don't know what the seedlings of galaxies are. So instead, what we're trying to do is we're trying to start from the end. We look around the universe and we see galaxies of particular types. We then look a little bit earlier in time and say, what type of galaxies do I see there? And then we look a bit further back in time and we say, well, what type of galaxies do I see there now? And if it turns out, for example, that you don't see these rich shell galaxies, in intermediate and very early times in the universe, then that gives us the ability to say, well, there's a very good chance that those things form late and they form because of X, Y, or Z. As I'm sure you've already realized though, the problem with that is being able to look back in time, being able to look at galaxies at the very beginning of the universe and the middle of the universe and then at the end of the universe or the current time in the universe. Fortunately, as astronomers, that isn't as difficult as it might sound. When we talk about time as astronomers, we typically refer to something that we call look-back time, which is if we have this time axis on the... Oh, we have another bingo? Excellent. Uh, <laughs> if we have this time axis on the bottom here, what we as astronomers usually do is we say, these are the first galaxies, this is today, but we don't care about linear time in the age of the universe. What we care about is look back time. So we flip that time axis around, we make ourselves zero, and we look back into the age of the universe. Now that might seem like a purely mathematical trick, but it has a very, very good reason behind it. And that's because while in our day-to-day -day lives, light, is sufficiently quick that we assume that it travels instantaneously, it doesn't. It travels at a finite speed. And because it travels at a finite speed, it takes time to go from point A to point B. And what that means is that we can use the time that it takes, light, to travel as a measure of distance. And that has some other really interesting outcomes. As a little bit of a test, if this is us here at the end of this distance axis, and I tell you that something sits one light second away, what is that thing? It is a very large thing. The moon, excellent. The moon is roughly one light second away. Let's try for round two. What is light eight light minutes away? What was that? The sun, exactly, fantastic, two from two. 52 light minutes away. Jupiter. Jupiter, excellent, three from three. Man, you guys are good. Has somebody else already given this talk? <laughs> <laughs> that, that, meh. Uh, okay, we're gonna ramp it up a little bit here. 25,600 light years. The center of the Milky Way is absolutely correct. And then, last of all, two and a half million light years away. 
Andromeda, absolutely. So these are our distance ladders and the time that it takes light to travel from point A to point B. But you'll notice that I've drawn the arrows in the opposite direction to the way in which I've been talking about them. I've drawn the arrows as going from those objects to us. And that wasn't a mistake because I'm bad at Keynote. That was because this is a very important outcome for our discussion. It takes light that many seconds, minutes, years, millions of years, to travel from these objects to us. Which means that when we stand on the Earth now, we see the moon as it was one second ago. We see Jupiter as it was 52 minutes ago, not as it is at the moment we are standing. And we see Andromeda as it was when Homo habilis was first making stone tools. And that has some very, very important implications for our discussion about galaxy evolution because what that means is that the further an object is away, the older it looks, or sorry, the younger it looks, the earlier in the universe it appears, which means that we can look at galaxies that are in nearby universe and they look as they do in the modern universe. We can look at galaxies that are then a half of the distance to the edge of the visible universe and they look as they did when the universe was half its age. And we can look at galaxies at the edge of the visible universe and they look as they did at the very beginning of the universe's evolution. And so we can actually do this task. We can actually look at galaxies as they were when they were young, when they were middling aged and now, and we can say, do we see these sorts of galaxies? Except kind of we can't. And the reason that we can't is because as light travels through the universe, it disperses, it gets fainter, so if you put a light bulb at the end of the street versus right in your face, it appears fainter at the end of the street. Same thing happens with galaxies. Which means that when we look at galaxies at the edge of the universe, we don't see them all. We only see the very brightest ones. So we don't see that picture. We see an incomplete picture. We see all of the galaxies in the nearby universe because they're very close and very easy to see. We see sort of a few of them in the middling universe and only a very, the very brightest at the distant universe. But this is then the picture. So we can still work with this, right? We can still take, we see spiral galaxies at the beginning of the universe and in the intermediate universe, but we only see these big shell objects in the, in the late universe. And we can still do our astronomy. Except there's another complication. Which is that the universe is not a static place. The universe, is expanding. What that means for us on a day-to-day -day basis is very little. What that means for astronomers normally is that galaxies in the universe are moving away from one another. It's how we actually detect the presence of this expansion. But what that means for our astronomy, for our galaxy evolution, is that when the universe is expanding, that has some very important consequences for light. So here I've drawn just a bunch of squares, which are basically units of universe area, if you will. As time progresses, these areas get larger. Now, if you imagine I had a wavelength of light that was at the very beginning box, and it was traveling through the universe for this entire time, it grows in the same degree as the growth of that unit area of universe. Now, who here remembers their high school physics? What is related to the wavelength of light? Color. color. Exactly right. Color. Which means that a purple piece of light emitted in the early universe will continually get redder and redder and redder and redder as it travels through the universe until the point that it arrives at us. And what that means is that when we look at galaxies that are very far away, we don't see the same colored light from stars as we would if that galaxy was in the nearby universe. 
Take, for example, Andromeda. Andromeda, we've already seen, is two and a half million light years away. So let's put ourselves here on the edge and let's draw Andromeda in the, in the universe two and a half million light years away. Now let's take Andromeda exactly as it is and let's drag it halfway across the universe. Place it there and observe it from Earth. What does Andromeda look like? What Andromeda looks like is very, very different. And that's because no longer do we see the same red light from these old stars and the dust lanes from, that are blocking that light. Instead, we start seeing the emission from all those very hot structures that Frank was talking to us about. We start seeing the emission from these very young stars, from these very hot regions of gas. Is that actually a simulation of an image of what Andromeda would look like, or is it a different No, so this is, the, this is Andromeda. This is actually Andromeda viewed in the ultraviolet. So it's exactly as it would look like if we moved it, because we've just basically taken all the emission from the very hot part of the spectrum and said, this is what we would actually see. So our picture here changes once again. Instead of seeing these galaxies in the low redshift universe as they are and then the middling and the far, instead now what we see is in the middling universe, we don't see just the stars and everything that we saw previously. Instead, we start to see these very hot, very blue parts of the, the, uh, the galaxies. If you go even further to the highest redshift end, not only do you no longer see these loops of stars and things, you now basically only see the most clumpy, high-energy parts of the galaxy. Galaxies in the very high redshift universe are extremely clumpy. Once again, clumpy. <laughs> and what that means is that making individual galaxies or, or, or comparing individual galaxies across these huge timelines is actually quite difficult. It's not always a very simple task. And so this is it. This is actually very close to the true picture that we have when we're trying to do galaxy evolution. What we are doing is we are looking at different galaxies at different stages of their morphology, emitting from different physical things and trying to say, this is like this, is like this, is like that. And that's the state that we have in galaxy evolution. So we now want to take this knowledge and we want to say, why does the Milky Way look the way that it does? And the answer is, well, it's complicated. We know that we've seen these very big objects with these shells around them in the early universe. These we call massive elliptical galaxies. These, we believe, are typically formed by huge numbers of large collisions that create these shells of stars around them that eventually go to collapse into this extremely chaotic ball of randomly orbiting stars. Spiral galaxies, on the other hand, are filled with both young and old stars. Spiral galaxies have most of their stars located in this disk, in these spiral arms, and they continue to form stars today because they are continually accreting little bits of gas. They're continually getting new bits of gas that create stars, and they're accreting little galaxies that end up forming things like what we see today, if you've ever been to the Southern Hemisphere, as the large and small Magellanic clouds, the two dwarf galaxies that orbit the Milky Way. But this isn't to say that we know everything by a very, very far opposite. We know a lot, but there is absolutely a lot left to understand. But very fortunately, not only is there a lot left to understand, there's absolutely plenty more of these pretty pictures to take. And that's all.